One of the greatest lies ever told by an accountant is that retirement plans are tax deductible. They're not. They're pre-tax because you don't take constructive receipt of the money so it never shows up as your income because you forfeited that money to your new business partner, the IRS. All right, so let's, let's get down to like practical things that we can do to put money in your pocket. And I'll, I'll start with, I had a meeting yesterday because I have this methodology that every three years I get a different set of eyes on my taxes. And I have a tax team and we meet with them. But I think that this is gonna apply to a lot of you. And what you could do is you can go back and instead of having to write the IRS a check, have them write you a check if you overpaid them in the last three years. You can amend your returns if you missed anything. So you can go back three years. Anyone in the room done any research and development for your practice, for health, for anything in the last three years? Yeah. All right. Did you take Section 199 R&D credits for that? Yeah, OK, so this is a lot of money that we're just going to like bring back to your life that's just been falling all over the place. I'm sure that the government efficiently deployed it, but the good news is you can have it back. Okay. So what you do is if you were a procrastinator and filed an extension in 2014, you can go all the way back to 2014. If you are too responsible, you miss out. So this is good for the procrastinators in the room. If you're responsible, you can only go back two years. If you're irresponsible, you can go back three years. Okay. So I filed an extension in 2014. I filed an extension even when I paid my taxes in full because I never know, you know, if I come up with some new ideas and I can go back on it. So my suggestion is pay them if you have to pay them, you know, and then file an extension even if you're paid in full. I could file an extension this year even though I paid everything. Why? Because I always like to buy time. I always like to keep them on notice that I have some degree of say in this, you know. So just, I'm sure you don't have a lot of financial professionals telling you to file an extension, but I, I saw a lot of people write that down like, damn, I like that idea. Yeah, let's do that. So R&D and also its cousin domestic production means you can go back and yes, you may have paid employees. Yes, you may have had expenses, but if you've built software, if you've written books, if you've created content series like video, if you've written research papers, if you've studied something about a technique or strategy or attended an event like this or this particular event, you can go back and instead of just writing off what you wrote the check for, you now get to write off the time that was spent on it if it was a US-based employee. You get to write off the income that came from that at a certain rate. So that's why you would go back for R&D credits and domestic production credits known as Section 199. Now, this so-called amazing tax bill that is, may I say, a huge pile of shit that we got in 2018, it cut out way more than it gave anyone, OK? Who, if you're in the top bracket, you went from 39.6 to 37%. Awesome. I don't really care about that. Even worse, if you're a service provider, which you guys are service providers, did you ever hear about this pass-through deduction that was going to come in the new tax bill? It's going to be this amazing thing. You don't get it if you're a service provider. So that pissed me off because I may not be a doctor. My son may be disappointed, but I work with so many of them. I'm like, oh, this is what you get for going into debt, you know, and, and taking all this extra time and helping people that you don't get the pass-through deduction. So there is a way to get the pass-through deduction. Here's how you do it. How many people in the room, and if you could show your hands, because I can't read mine, thank God. Um, you know, who here has intellectual property that they've created? Okay, if you've created intellectual property, you can actually set up an intellectual property company. By setting up that intellectual property company, your first advantage is you've created asset protection. You're in a high liability business, and now all of a sudden, you've separated out some of the value into different activities. It's going to be harder for people to get their hands on that than if everything you have is one, in one entity. Number two. You can actually pay less tax by paying a percentage of all your practice's income to the intellectual property company because it's now paid as a royalty or as a 1099 income versus W-2. But when you pay yourself W-2, you have up to 15.3% more tax because of self-employment. So we can avoid up to 15.3% tax. That's really cool. But now you get the pass-through deduction in your IP company which could be a 20%. So 
right there, for some of you, that's 35% savings. So now your effective tax rate might be 15 or 20 on some of your income. All right, so I'm, I'm giving you strategy. And I could, spe I could spout off strategy forever, and it'd be great, but implementing it might be a little bit more complicated. So let me give you the framework so that you could think like this. Because I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax attorney. I know you guys are shocked that I'm not. Um, like the, my CPA, I, am, I almost didn't hire him because he told a joke the first time and it was pretty funny. I was like, dude, that's way too much personality for your profession. I don't know if I feel comfortable with this. Because I said, why should I hire you? First question I asked. And he goes, you like Vegas? I'm like, yeah, I like Vegas, all right. And he's like, would you like to make every trip tax deductible? It's like, so you're in Vegas. He's like, yep, you can make every trip tax deductible. I'm like, damn, that's a, that's a good argument. You're at least part of the team now. <laughs> I, I don't know what else you could do, but we've got one thing down. I, I actually told him a joke, not quite as funny. I said, dude, you know the difference between an introverted accountant and an extroverted accountant? I said, no, what is it? I said, well, an introverted accountant, when they talk to you, they look at your shoes, at their shoes. The extroverted one, they look at your shoes. I really effed that up, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. And he laughed, which concerned me, that he uh, laughed, you know, because I, I, didn't, I don't like that much personality for these tax guys. So this is the framework. The first thing is, you've got to build a, you've got to build a team. Be proactive with the team and look at your returns every three years by a different set of eyes. So what does that team look like? First off, you gotta have a bookkeeper. If you don't give them the data, they can't give you the advice, and if you give them the data late, meaning after the year's over, between January and uh, April the next year, you miss out on all your tax deductions, and about the only thing they tell you to do, and tell me if you've experienced this, is tell you to put money in a retirement plan. Yeah. One of the greatest lies ever told by an accountant is that retirement plans are tax deductible. They're not. They're pre-tax because you don't take constructive receipt of the money so it never shows up as your income because you forfeited that money to your new business partner, the IRS, and said, great, I'll be your partner. They say, we won't take any money right now. We'll wait till later when hopefully it's grown. And then they can take more. Look, man, those plans, if you have them, I'm sorry. There's at least three things you can do about it, though. <coughs> Number one, you bite the bullet, you cash it out, you pay the penalty. I know the word penalty scares everybody. I'm, I went to Catholic school. It's scary. Um, I got hit in Catholic school, actually, shockingly. Um, so, so you've got that. Or, number two, you can roll it over to a self-directed. And that self-directed, you could buy other practices. You could buy land. You have less restriction. So all of a sudden, that opens it up. Number three, I, can, oh God, I actually, there's four. I only told you there's three. What a great day. <laughs> what if I told you of four and there's three, it would be a shitty day. But um, <laughs> it's now a great day. So, <laughs> so number three is you can do a 72T distribution, meaning by the way, if you're over 59 and a half, you don't have to worry about this. You can just do it. You don't have to do number three. If you're younger than 59 and a half, normally you have a 10% penalty if you take the money out. But a 72T allows you to start taking money out without the 10% penalty. Or number four, everyone in the room probably makes too much money if, you're, if you own your practice to contribute to a Roth, Roth IRA. But you get a one-time conversion where you can convert any 401k, SEP, simple, any kind of IRA to a Roth IRA as a one-time activity. And so if you convert that, you have to pay taxes. But there's about a dozen different investments where you can get a low valuation as far as the government's concerned. Even though you haven't lowered your cash flow, you've just lowered what is the perceived value of that lump sum. We would call that a rescue strategy. So, that would cut your taxes in half. There's, I'll even give you another strategy on this. There's, a, there's another, anyone in here charitable? Mm -hmm. I'll look at only like three people. You guys are mean people. <laughs> what if you're being charitable? I know, Marv, you raised your hand now. I said you're mean. I'm just joking. I mean, I'm, I'm charitable, but not as charitable as people think, like, because I have, I, I donate a lot to my university. I donate all this, but 
I also do it and get more tax advantage than the donation. So I don't mind the accolades, but I really like the tax advantage. So there's something called a charitable trust that if you're ever to sell your business, you're ever to sell a building that you own that you'd normally pay tax on, you can move it to a charitable trust, which is any 501c3 that qualifies, get a tax deduction when you donate it, sell it to whoever you want, have it fund the trust, and the trust has two, pen two beneficiaries. You're the first one. You're the first beneficiary of the trust. So now you have a tax deduction that can offset the taxes when you pull money out of a retirement plan. But now you have your full, full money of, at work after you sell whatever it is to invest, not the net amount after tax. So you now have, no, now have more at work. The charity just has to be able to keep, in theory, 10% of that original gift. So charity gets at least 10. Government gets zero. Cool? Six strategies on that were bonus. I wasn't planning on giving you any of them, really. Uh, so the first thing is you build this team. Bookkeeper, so you have the information. CPA that is a tax strategist, so that they can help you identify your tax deductions. We're going to give you a bunch of those. Third is an attorney or multiple attorneys. Could be a corporate attorney to choose the right corporate structure to classify your income properly, or a tax attorney that could teach you something called tax arbitrage, which are ways that you can just put more money in your pocket than what you spend on different things in the tax world. And then lastly, anyone own their building in here? An engineer. Engineer isn't like a long-term player on the team, it's just a one-time usually, where they can do a cost segregation study and accelerate your depreciation so you can write things off faster rather than waiting for 39 years to get all your deductions. So you build this team, you meet with the team at least quarterly, sometimes that's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's usually not a really long meeting, and then your job is to be a brainstorming entrepreneur. So you get to say whatever you want in that call and you don't get in trouble with the law. It's only what they file that matters. So I like to ask them questions like, hey, what's the coolest strategy you've done in the last three months for any of your clients? Could that apply to me? Hey, can I write this off? Can I write that off? Can I write going to Italy off? Can I write my espresso machine off? Can I write these clothes off that I bought? Like, I just ask them everything. And when they say no, I'm like, but what if I do it this way? Or what if it was like for this? And I just keep going through the questions until they go, dude, you're wasting time. There's no way we're going to be able to write off your clothes. I'm like, wait, do you think that Delta gets to write off the uniforms for their pilots? They're like, yeah. I'm like, what do I got to do to make things a uniform? So I found a way. Now, I would say that that's the grayest thing that I do, which isn't bad. Can, OK, and not in my life, but in taxes. <laughs> okay. I'm a, it's a bad, I've been doing stand-up comedy, so this is why you're getting some of this stuff. <laughs> uh, but that's the, that's the whole job of the meeting is to brainstorm. Then. They're all on notice that every three years, I'm getting a different set of eyes. And when I get that different set of eyes, all I tell them is, I'll pay your standard fee to analyze everything. If you find anything, I'll double your fee. So I'm incentivizing them to find things. And I don't think that my existing team is bad. I just think that it's a complicated world in the, in the, in the game of tax, right? And so sometimes you get in, like you probably had patients that they forget to tell you really important things because they see you. It's the same thing in this world of tax. So that's just step one of the framework, is you build the team, you get proactive with them, and you look every three years to see if you get them in. That's step one.